again, 1 John chapter 4. John, the apostle, is the only one that refers to an evil man as the Antichrist. However, as we noticed last week, throughout the book of Daniel in the Old Testament, there's a reference to a person, he doesn't call him the Antichrist because that wouldn't make sense to him, but he calls him the beast. The apostle Paul doesn't call him the Antichrist, he calls him the man of sin, or he calls him the man of lawlessness. And when we come to the book of Revelation, more and more he's going to be referred to as the beast. And so we're going to talk about this unusual situation because the Bible tells us that as we get near to the end of the situation of the world's existence, this evil person is going to rise up and he's going to cause many people to stop believing in Christ. He's going to cause people to start living in immorality. And there are several scriptures given in the New Testament that show us we're coming close to the end times. Let me read 1 John chapter 4. This first paragraph. Dear friends, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. This is how you can recognize the Spirit of God. Every spirit that acknowledges that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God, but every spirit that does not acknowledge Jesus is not from God. This is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you've heard is coming, and even now is already in the world. <clears throat> John is going to say, already in his time, there will be false teachers who will try to come into the church. They will teach false doctrines, and the doctrine that they're going to teach is that Jesus Christ is not the Son of God. They're going to teach that Jesus did not come from God. Well, Several weeks ago, we, we read in 1 John chapter 2, let me read verse 18, what John says. Dear children, this is the last hour, and as you've heard that the Antichrist is coming, even now many Christs have come, this is how we know it is the last hour. Now for John the Apostle to say in his day, this is the last hour, well, that was 2,000 years ago. So how does that make sense to us? Well, as you and I think about our life, we think about the history of the world, when is the last hour for us? Not long old. You may live another 50 years, but compared to the history of the world, that's not long. You may live another 60 years or more. That's not long. Some of us don't have 50 years left. And we can all make this confession, this is the last hour. And so the question is, well, what are we supposed to do about it? What is going to be our response to the understanding that the last hour is with us? And then there's this situation that arises that in the world, there's going to be an actual evil person that will arrive and uh, we don't know who he is yet because he hasn't been explained or exposed, but there is an actual person. He may be alive today in the world and we don't know it, but before the end time comes, he will be recognized, he will be evil, he's going to have a companion called the false prophet and they will disrupt the church, they will disrupt the world and God's wrath is going to be poured out. But here's the ingredient that we really like. God's wrath is not going to be poured out on the church. God's wrath is going to be poured out on those that are evil. But when the wrath of God comes, you're not going to be here. I'm not going to be here because we're going to already be with Jesus. And so several things will arise that we're going to read today. But we bear in message we bear the message that what we do is we encourage one another. So let's start reading some, some, uh, some verses. 
I'm going to start with 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. And if you don't have your Bible, that's okay. We'll read in, in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. And it reads like this. There's a heading in my Bible right above chapter 2 that says, The Man of Lawlessness. And here's what the scripture says about it. This is a long reading, but we're talking about this evil person that's coming into the world. Verse 1, 2 Thessalonians 2, Concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our being gathered to Him, we ask you, brothers, not to become easily unsettled or alarmed by some prophecy, report, or letter supposed to have come from us, saying that the day of the Lord has already come, don't let anyone deceive you in that way, for that day will not come until the rebellion occurs and the man of lawlessness is revealed, the man doomed to destruction. He will oppose and will exalt himself over everything that is called God or is worship, so that he sets himself up in God's temple proclaiming himself to be God. Wow. This is ridiculous, but this is one man going to live, he's an actual man, he's going to be working for Satan, but he's going to start out as just a wise person, as a good person who's going to help the situation, but he's a deceiver. Don't you remember that when I was with you, I used to tell you these things? And now you know what's holding him back, so that he may reveal that the proper time, well, the time is the proper time coming very soon. For the secret power of lawlessness is already at work, but the one who holds it back will continue to do so until he's taken out of the way. And then the lawless one will be revealed, whom the Lord Jesus will overthrow with the breath of his mouth and destroy by the splendor of his coming. The coming of the lawless one will be in accordance with the work of Satan, displayed in all kinds of counterfeit miracles, signs, and wonders and every sort of evil that deceives those who are perishing. They perish because they refuse to love the truth and to be saved. And for this reason, God sent them a powerful delusion so that they will believe the lie and so that all will be condemned who have not believed the truth but have delighted in wickedness. Okay, that's kind of a negative reading. Paul here, writing to the Thessalonians, is making the point. There is going to come into the world an actual man. He's going to look like an actual person. He is an actual person, but he is an evil man. And he's going to seek to destroy the church. He's going to set himself up as God himself. And the reason he's going to be able to do that, because the world is going to be in a terrible situation. There's going to be anger, there's going to be division, there's going to be all kinds of problems in the world. There's going to be COVID, there's going to be other problems that will come. And he's going to come as our Savior to save us. But Paul is saying, John is saying, Daniel is saying, don't believe this man. He's a liar. He's working for the devil. He's an instrument of Satan. But you... Look to Jesus Christ and keep your faith in Him. You know, I know we're getting ready to read some things where Paul and others are going to tell us that terrible things are going to happen in the world. And last week I asked you, how do you know what are some of the signs of the coming of Jesus Christ is going to be? What are some of the signs of the coming of the evil man? And you gave the correct response. Let's remember some of them again. What are some of the signs of the end time? There will be what? Wars. What? Wars. What did you say? Wars. Wars. Wars War. and rumors of wars. Wars and rumors of wars. Thank you. <laughs> what else? Earthquakes. 
earthquakes. There are going to be earthquakes. And these are not going to be normal earthquakes. They will continue to be more and more. And they'll become harsher and harsher. Earthquakes. What else? There will be pestilence, which means what? Diseases and all kinds of problems are coming to the world. Let me read now from 1 Thessalonians. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. There's a long paragraph here that says the coming of the Lord. But you and I want to know about the coming of the Lord. What, when's that going to happen? What are some of the signs of His coming? We're going to read some words from Paul. We're going to read some more from Daniel. We'll read uh, from John in the book of Revelation. And we're not going to understand exactly what we're reading because, uh, you know, we're going to be the same as the disciples who asked Jesus a number of questions. They didn't understand what he was saying. And you remember Daniel? Oh, everybody loves Daniel. And he had this vision. And he understood that there's going to be this beast that will come into the world. And he's asking the Lord, when will this come? What's going to be the sign of his coming? And what does God tell Daniel through Michael the archangel? He says, Daniel, don't you worry about it. You just go your way. God said in due time he'll take care of it. And Daniel, you're not going to understand it. But you just keep on loving the Lord. And so let me read from 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Brothers and ladies, we do not want you to be ignorant about those who fall asleep or to grieve like the rest of the men who have no hope. We believe that Jesus died and rose again so that we, so that we believe that God will bring with Jesus those who have fallen asleep in Him. I mean those who have already died. According to the Lord's own word, we tell you that we who are still alive, who are left of the coming of the Lord, will certainly not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord Himself will come down from heaven with a loud command and the voice of the archangel and the trumpet call of God and the dead in Christ will rise first. After that, we who are still alive and are left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so will we ever be with the Lord forever. Therefore, encourage each other with these words. Wow. Do you know what's going to happen to you? You know what's going to happen to me? And we'll be doing it together. We're going to be hearing the voice of God and we're going to be lifted up immediately to be with the Lord. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. And then God's wrath is going to be poured out on those who deny Him. And the, mo the most terrible thing that have ever happened will happen. And so let me read some more words from 1 Thessalonians. Chapter 5, verse 1. Now, brothers, about times and dates, we don't need to write you. For you know very well that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. While people are saying peace and safety, destruction will come on them suddenly as labor pains on a pregnant woman. Oh, but you brothers, you're not in darkness so that this day should not surprise you like a thief. You are all sons of the light and sons of the day. We do not belong to the night or to darkness. So then let us not be like others who are asleep, but let us be alert and self-control. For those who sleep, sleep at night. Those who get drunk, get drunk at night. But since you belong to the day, let us be self-controlled, putting on faith and love as a breastplate and the hope of salvation as a helmet. For God did not appoint us to suffer wrath, but to receive salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. He died for us, so that whether we are awake or asleep, we may live together with Him. Therefore, encourage one another, build each other up, just in fact you're doing. You and I, on a regular basis, come to worship God on Sunday morning. 
A part of our worship <coughs> is, is to do what Paul keeps saying. You just come to encourage one another. And we encourage one another as we speak to one another, as we visit with one another, and then as we worship together and we sing songs together. And these songs, the Apostle Paul says, we're speaking to one another when we sing. We're speaking to God. We're speaking to each other. And the message of the songs that we sing are to encourage one another. Now there are times in the church when the preaching needs to be very bold. The preaching needs to be very precise. Condemning sin, concerning immorality behavior. But for the most part, the preaching needs to lift us up to encourage us. There are those who are falling away and they're not interested in, in worshiping Jesus Christ. But together, we're called back to follow Christ, believe in Christ, confess Christ, encourage one another with these words. And you know what he says? Let me read again. 1 Thessalonians 5, I'll start in verse 12. We urge you, brothers, warn those who are idle, encourage the timid, help the weak, be patient with everyone. Make sure that nobody pays back wrong for wrong, but always try to be kind to each other and be kind to everyone else. Verse 16, be joyful always. Pray continually. Give thanks in all circumstances. For this is God's will for you in Jesus Christ. Do not put out the Spirit's fire. Do not treat prophecies with contempt. Test everything. Hold on to what's good. Avoid every kind of evil. And he just goes on and on. And then he says, May God himself, the God of peace, sanctify you through and through. May your whole spirit soul and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. This is the one who calls you, and he's going to do it. Wow. You know, we have all talked with people who are considering the possibility of death. And always, or not always, but too often we'll hear the confession that says, but I'm, I'm not worthy. I want to go to heaven, but I haven't done enough. No, you haven't done enough. But Jesus has. We need to turn our thinking around. Instead of looking at ourselves and our weaknesses and making those confessions, we need to confess that, yes, but Jesus Christ as Lord, He's able. He's the one that has paid the price. Let me read from 2 Timothy. 2 Timothy chapter... Uh, chapter 3. 2 Timothy chapter 3. The Apostle Paul is giving a description of the situation in the world. He's not talking about his time, but he's talking about how the situation in the world will be as we get close to the end. And here's what's going to happen. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 1. But mark this, there will be terrible times in the last days. That's not what I wanted to hear. I think about the future, and you know what I would like to happen? Same thing that you believe. We would like to see a great revival. We would like to see immorality done away with. We would like to see respect and love shown over and over again. We would like everything to be good and peaceful and quiet. We would like politicians to get along. But this is what the Bible says. The Bible says, mark this. There's going to be terrible times in the last days. People will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, and boastful, and proud, and abusive, and disobedient to their parents, and ungrateful and unholy, without love, unforgiving, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, brutal, not lovers of the good, treacherous, 
rash, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying its power, have nothing to do with them. Wow. If you were to describe the situation of the world today and America and in politics and in other business relationships, you know, you could use some of these same illustrations. This is the world is. There are terrible times in the last days. We read from Titus while I'm nearby. Titus chapter 2. For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men. It teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this present age while we wait for the blessed hope, the glorious appearing of the great God and Savior Jesus Christ who gave himself for us to redeem us from all wickedness and to purify himself of people that are his very own, eager to do what's good. Wow. If we could get a fuller understanding of who we are and what Jesus sees in us, it's going to change our thinking about everything. The glorious appearing of our great God and Savior Jesus Christ Encourage one another with these words, he says, over and over again. Powerful. Now then, I want to say again, things are going to happen that we don't understand. That's not unusual. Jesus taught his disciples some things about the last days, and we may have a hard time understanding because the disciples didn't understand. But one of the great collections of end time events is going to be recorded in Matthew chapter 24. You know Matthew chapter 24 already, but I want to look at some of these words as Jesus teaches his disciples in Matthew chapter 24. The disciples had questions and Jesus gives answers and they still do not understand and they will not understand until we get to the day of Pentecost, and uh, that comes later. But in chapter 24 of the Gospel of Matthew, there's a heading in my Bible that says, Signs of the End of the Age. Jesus is going to be giving some signs of two things, and there it's sometimes it's kind of confusing because we don't know which one he's talking about. First of all, Jesus will talk about the destruction of Jerusalem. Jerusalem is going to be destroyed. And then he's going to be talking about the coming of the Lord in the end times and the destruction of evil. And sometimes we get confused what Jesus is talking about. And the disciples are confused. But let's start reading in chapter 24 of the Gospel of Matthew. And here's what he's going to say. I'm going to read chapter 24. Start in verse 11. Many false prophets will appear and deceive many people because of the increase of wickedness. The love of most will grow cold, but he who stands firm to the end will be saved. And this is the gospel of the kingdom that will be preached to the whole world as a testimony to all nations, and then the end will come. Okay, Jesus is saying to his disciples, Terrible things are going to happen. The end is going to come. But the end will not come until the gospel is preached. And it needs to be preached to the whole world. And that's why I want to say a word about my grandson, Joel, who is getting ready to be a missionary in the country of Tanzania. That's somewhere in Africa. I don't know anything about him. But come this coming... December, and that's not long off, Joel and several others with the Agates of Christ are going to go on a mission trip to the other side of Africa. Our prayer is going to be with you and your whole team. 
I'm going to read again from Matthew chapter 24 and verse 24. False prophets will appear. They're going to perform great signs and miracles to deceive even the elect. Wow. And he's going to tell us in verse 29 of chapter 24, the sun will be darkened, the moon will not give its light, the stars will fall from the sky, the heavenly bodies will be shaken. And now learn this lesson, he says in verse 32. Learn this lesson from the fig tree. That's a reference to the country of Israel. Something is going to happen to the Jewish people. And if you see something happen in Israel, you need to know that God is, is at work here. Now then, Israel is, a, is now a nation again. For the most part, the Jewish people are not believers in Jesus Christ. It is actually a very immoral nation at this time. One of the most evil cities in the world is Tel Aviv, where every kind of immorality is, is taking place. They are not lovers of the New Testament church. But when you see Israel become a nation again, Jesus is going to tell us and Paul will tell us things are about to change. Keep your eyes on Israel. And the disciples want to know, well, when is something like that going to happen? And so he answers in verse, uh, let me read 36 of chapter 24. No one knows about the day or hour or even the angels in heaven or the sun, but only the Father. For it, was in, for it was in the days of Noah, so will it be at the coming of the Son of Man. Therefore, verse 42, keep watch, because you do not know on what day the Lord will come. But understand this, if the owner of the house had not known at what time the thief might come, he would have kept watch and he would not have let his house be broken into. And so you also must be ready because the Son of Man will come at an hour when you do not expect it. There are going to be two reactions to what Jesus said. Number one, we're going to be discouraged and scared and full of fear. Or we're going to say, blessed be the Lord. I'm going to be looking up, waiting for His coming, looking for His coming. And what a blessing that will be. Let me read now from the book of Revelation. These words you know. I'm going to start in Revelation chapter 13. And we're hurrying through some of this, and I realize we're going too fast. But you get the message that I'm trying to portray that is over and over again, the same message is given. Believe in Jesus Christ and do what is right. Let me read from Revelation 13. There's a section in my Bible called The Beast Out of the Earth. That's Revelation chapter 13. I'm going to start in verse 11. It's going to be a reference to the Antichrist that John talked about. But here he's going to be called the Beast. And so John the Apostle writes this, verse 11, chapter 13. Then I saw another beast coming out of the earth. He had two horns like a lamb, but he spoke like a dragon. He's going to be talking about the Antichrist. He exercised all the authority of the first beast on his behalf and made the earth and its inhabitants worship the first beast whose fatal wound had been healed. He performed great and miraculous signs. We're talking about the Antichrist. Even causing fire to come down from heaven in full view of all men. Because of the signs he was given power to do on behalf of the first beast, he deceived the inhabitants of the earth. He ordered them to set up an Im image in honor of the beast who was wounded by the sword and yet lived. He was given power to give breath to the image of the first beast so that it could speak and cause all who refused to worship the image to be killed. He also forced everyone, small and great, rich and poor, free and slave, to receive a mark on his right hand or on his forehead, 
so that no one could buy or sell unless he had the mark, which is the name of the beast or the number of his name. Ooh. This calls for wisdom. If anyone has insight, let him calculate the number of the beast, for it is the man's number. His number is 666. <clears throat> This doesn't apply to you. You're not going to go to the grocery store someday to buy your food and when you get ready to be checked out, they're not going to look at your forehead and see if you have 666 on your forehead. But that time is coming that's going to happen. It's going to happen in the United States of America. It's going to happen in every country in the world. When people go to buy something, they are going to have to have a mark in their hand or a mark on their forehead. It does not apply to you. That's not going to happen to you because you're going to already be lifted up to be with Jesus Christ in the clouds. And so that's why I'm going to read from Revelation chapter 19. You're going to love this reading. You love it. Jesus said this is going to happen to the small and the great. Doesn't make any difference. I'm going to read from chapter 19 about verse 7. For the Lord our God Almighty reigns. Let us rejoice and be glad and give Him glory, for the wedding of the Lamb has come. <coughs> Blessed are those who are invited to the wedding supper of the Lamb. Well, then I'm going to start reading in verse 11. I know this is hard for you to comprehend, hard to believe, but you're going to be coming with Jesus Christ riding a horse. Hmm wonder about that. But here's what John said, verse 11. I saw heaven standing open, and there before me was a white horse, whose rider is called Faithful and True. With justice he judges and makes war. His eyes are like blazing fire, and on his head are many crowns. He has a name written on him that no one knows but he himself. He's dressed in a robe dipped in blood, and his name is the Word of God. The armies of heaven who followed him riding on white horses, that's you, and dressed in fine living, white and clean. And out of his mouth comes a sharp sword with which he will strike down the nations. He will rule them with a rod of iron. He treads the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God on his robe and on his thigh. He has this name written, King of Kings and Lord Lord of Lords. I saw an angel standing in the sun. He cried out with a loud voice to all the birds flying in the air. In verse 19, Then I saw the beasts and the kings of the earth and their armies gathered together to make war against the rider on the horse and his army. That's part of you. But the beast was captured. And with him the false prophet who had performed the miraculous signs on his behalf. With these signs he was deluded, and he deluded those who had received the mark of the beast and worshipped his image. The two of them were thrown alive into the fire lake of burning sulfur. The rest of them who were killed with the sword that came out of his mouth. In other words, God is going to take care of the situation. Jesus just... He's not going to come with the sword that will condemn you, but He's coming just with the words of His mouth to condemn those who are evil. Over and over again, when the reading like that, the Bible just says, encourage one another. You know, as we talk about these verses from 1 Thessalonians, 2 Thessalonians, <coughs> Titus, we are revived again to think over and over again the majesty, the power, the goodness, the greatness of Jesus Christ when He comes. Therefore, we keep asking the same question that the Bible answers over and over. If Jesus is coming, how are we supposed to live now? And you can answer that by saying several different sentences in different ways. But now I want you to respond in a sentence 
how are we supposed to live now according to what the Bible says? And you can use words that the Bible has already expressed. So give me an answer. Anybody, how are we supposed to live now considering the coming of Jesus Christ, His wrath being poured out on the evil, and His blessings to bless those who are in Christ already? Give me an answer. How are we supposed to live now? Live in truth, obedience, and live in truth in the light. You live with obedience. What was your other statement? Live and follow the truth of the Bible. Yes, over and over. What else, brother? Approach every situation with the question, what would Jesus do? What would Jesus do? Be prepared. You what? Be prepared. You be prepared. And you you find out from looking at the life of Jesus, what would he do? How did he act in former situations? Brothers? Live without fear. You live without fear. Thank you. Because the world is going to be caught up in something that would normally cause people to fear. But instead of living in fear, there has been given to us a gift that we're to live without fear, but to live with joy and to live with encouragement. Thank you.